Good morning from Rome and welcome to EWTN's live coverage of Pope Benedict XVI's funeral mass, which is about to take place right here at St. Peter's Square. The mass will be presided over by his successor, Pope Francis, in a profoundly historic moment for the church. And then our 265th pontiff, Pope Benedict, will be laid to rest. I'm Catherine Hadro, and joining me for this historic moment is our esteemed panel. Father Raymond D'Souza serves as a priest in Ontario, Canada for the Archdiocese of Kingston. He is also a contributor to the National Catholic Register. Dr. Matthew Bunsen is executive editor and Washington, D.C. bureau chief for EWTN News and Father Roger Landry is the Catholic chaplain for the Columbia University in New York City. He previously served in the diplomatic service for the Holy See at the United Nations. As you can see, it is foggy here. It is quite cold, about 40 degrees here in St. Peter's Square. The crowd is continuing to stream in. Um, still quite small compared to other papal uh, funerals that we have seen. Father D'Souza, can you first remind us about the unique nature of today's funeral mass? Well, first of all, papal funerals aren't that common. The last one was 2005, before that 1978, although there were two that year. Uh, but what makes this one unusual is that it's a retired pope uh, being buried without friction, without crisis, uh, with love by his successor. Uh, so this is something we've never seen before, ever in the history of the church. So that makes it unusual because almost everything we've done we've seen before. And we've seen over the last 10 years that Pope Francis has spoken with affection about Pope Benedict. He goes to visit him. And so it's not just, you know, one office holder bearing his predecessor, but it's someone over the last 10 years. He's spoken about Pope Francis, pardon me, as Pope Benedict as a grandfather, sustaining the church. So I think there's going to be a kind of emotion that we feel here, that it's not someone uh, who's bearing just a predecessor, mm -hmm. but someone who he really has love for. I think we've seen that. And... Uh, so historic, certainly, but I also think we're going to see something a bit unusual on the level, not just of history, but of emotion and love, really, this morning. We're expecting any minute now for Pope Benedict XVI's body to be brought out from St. Peter's Basilica and outside to the square um, before the leading up to the Mass. It was expected, the Vatican estimates, nearly 200,000 people have paid their respects this week alone in that three-day period um, and then they closed the casket yesterday ahead of this funeral mass today. Yeah, the, one of the unusual aspects of uh, what Father Roger and Father Raymond was talking about was that we have in Pope Francis uh, somebody who is able to visit uh, his predecessor which is itself almost unheard of <laughs> But he was able to visit someone who, unique in the world, could understand the burden of the papacy. And I think mm -hmm. the, the relationships that the two of them had, and this is, we can talk more about this, it'll be interesting to see what the sense is, the perspective of Pope Francis as he's on the Sacrado today, saying goodbye to a man who has been here for 10 years into his own papacy. The last papal funeral mass would have been St. John Paul II, and of course that was presided over by Pope Benedict XVI when he was Cardinal Ratzinger immediately before he was elected pontiff. As a priest, Catherine, whenever you bury somebody you know, mm. particularly a family member, you cannot celebrate that mass the same way you would celebrate an ordinary mass. And so for Pope Francis to celebrate the funeral for Pope Benedict, like Cardinal Ratzinger mm -hmm. for St. John Paul II, that is a different type of prayer that is made. Every time you celebrate, it's supposed to be devout. But when you actually know the person as a friend whom you're entrusting into the outstretched arms of the Lord, you do that differently. So I think we're going to see the real tenderness of mm. Pope Francis today as he honors his predecessor and as he tries to glorify God by giving his predecessor over to the Lord. The gospel today we know mm -hmm. is St. Luke's in which we're going to ponder Jesus' last words to the Father. Mm -hmm. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And the whole church today is going to commend Benedict to that same Lord, that same Father to whom Jesus entrusted himself. Obviously a, a solemn mood right now, being that we're about to celebrate a funeral mass here shortly. Um, but again, as we've been saying throughout the week, gratitude as well in that morning. Well, gratitude for an extraordinary life, uh, but also I think a lesson for all of us that this is how things should unfold. 
uh, an elderly man should die and should be ready to die, and he was both of those things. Uh, so there is that, um, it's not bittersweet, it's not the right word, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a mourning that's, uh, that's not devastating, right. but colored by hope. Right. Uh, and one of the things that Father Roger had mentioned earlier in the week about the Tadeum, that prayer of thanksgiving mm. to God, which Pope Benedict had referenced, as Father Roger reminded us at the beginning of his pontificate, in, there's a document that's put into the casket, which is the official record of the pontificate, and it begins with, you know, so-and-so died on this date and such forth. And it actually says right there, he said, on the morning of December 31st, in preparation for the singing of the Te Deum, which is traditionally at the end of the year to give thanks for all of God's blessings in the year. So uh, it could be that the uh, that document was redrafted after they heard Father Roger earlier <laughs> in the week. Uh, but even if not, um, I'm glad he pointed it out. But it's beautiful that he died as the church was preparing to say, thanks mm. be to God for all of the blessings. And we today are offering our own kind of Tadeum for a very specific blessing, which is the life, long life of Joseph Ratzinger, our Holy Father, Pope Benedict yeah. XVI. In the Gospel, the day that he died is the first 18 verses of St. John's Gospel, in which we ponder grace upon grace. And normally, when we hear that liturgically, we're thinking about the graces of the previous year, mm -hmm. which are supposed to be the foundations for the next. But when Pope Benedict died, there's grace upon grace. He received so many graces from the Lord that he used as down payments for future graces. But then all of us have received that extraordinary grace. But we're not supposed to bury it like the talent that Jesus describes in one of his gospel parables, but we're supposed to invest it to bear fruit from this extraordinary inheritance we've received from a very, very generous German disciple and yes. bishop of Rome. Absolutely. There's a connection in some ways between the formal canonization. We're not getting ahead of ourselves in any way here. But when we canonize someone, for example, the, the canonization of Pope St. John Paul II or Pope mm -hmm. Paul VI, we were not so much canonizing the Pope as much as we were canonizing Carol Wotiwa, or we were doing the proclamation of the canonization mm -hmm. of Montini. Today, we are certainly here for the funeral of Pope Benedict XVI, but mm -hmm. this is as much the funeral of Joseph Ratzinger. And in that sense, this opportunity to celebrate his life, to reflect on his life and the contributions that he has given to us. Yesterday, Pope Francis referred to him as a master catechist. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to continuing to learn from Joseph Ratzinger, even today, as he lies here in the, the square of St. Peter's. And I know we'll discuss this at length throughout our live coverage today, but if you could each quickly summarize, what do we think that legacy will be? What stands out to you right now when it comes to Pope Benedict's life? Well, in that spiritual testament, which he wrote in 2006, so that's almost, what, 16 years ago, he talked about how out of the tangle of confusions comes the reasonableness of faith. That's what he wanted the world to hear from him when he died. Mm -hmm. uh, and that reasonableness of faith in great encyclicals like Fides et Ratio and Lumen Fide, neither of which carried his name, but who, of, he was a big force, uh, his, ma his masterful addresses, uh, and his conviction that the human mind and the human heart could know the truth and know the truth about mm -hmm. himself, about the world, about God. That's, I think, his uh, legacy and that that knowledge made us free and able to love. I think that's, uh, that's what I would say. That's beautiful. I would clearly say that his greatest legacy was the way he always sought to lead us to God. Mm. When we look at the charism of leadership, there are strengths and weaknesses in any leader. Mm -hmm. And when he assumed the papacy at 78 years old, he was well aware of his weaknesses. He was not going to be a great administrator he knew he needed help around him, etc. But what his strength was, was 
to lead us to God. He tried to do that by teaching us how to pray. He gave a year and a half of catechesis to try to help us to pray better. He did it by the way he prayed and especially sought to pray the Mass to make sure that at Mass we had a theocentric experience, that we were really focused on God rather than everything else. And then he sought to engage the world especially the secular world. Mm. He had defined mm -hmm. secularism as living as if God didn't exist. And he wanted to remind the world that God, in fact, did, that he mm. came into the world to be with us. And he saw his life project and his papal mission to help us to discover that Emmanuel, God with us, is still very much with us, loving us, saving us, accompanying us, calling us, and wanting to welcome us forever, like we pray he did December 31st, yes. Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, into the house of the Father. Yes. We go back to 1968 and his magnificent book, Introduction to Christianity, mm -hmm. and we see that as a reflection of his thoughts uh, on the Second Vatican Council, the, the, the chaos that followed, not because of the Council, but because of the way it was interpreted and, and all mm -hmm. of that. But at starting to ask those questions even then of what was happening in society, in culture, mm -hmm. and having a response to that. You mentioned uh, the, the dangers of secularism, the dangers of relativism. Mm -hmm. That becomes this recurring theme, but it isn't simply a lament, it isn't simply a, a complaint uh, a listing of crimes and enormities on the part of, of modern mm -hmm. culture, but always proposing a solution. And the solution for him was always an encounter with a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And then orienting so much of his writing around that idea of mm -hmm. a Christocentric reality for Catholics that has to be expressed also in our love of the Eucharist. Well, one of the most famous phrases uh, was just on the eve of his election, uh, talk about the dictatorship of relativism, as mm -hmm. Matthew just mentioned. And if you have a dictatorship, you need a revolution. That's how you overthrow a dictator. And then later that summer at Cologne, he said, the true revolutionaries in the world and in history are the saints. Mm -hmm. So uh, Pope Benedict, Joseph Ratzinger, thought to be a more cerebral man. Well, he was a cerebral man. Uh, not the kind of person who would lead a battlefield kind of... Uh, insurgency, but he identified on the eve of his pontificate that, that we were threatened by a dictatorship. And then he said, we need to overthrow that dictatorship and the revolution we need is are the saints. And uh, I don't think anybody else on the planet would have put those two things together in the space of four or five months. So, But he likewise, both pre-papal and papal work, always talked about Jesus as the true revolutionary. Yes. So he was the vicar of the one who brought the definitive revolution to the human race in bringing us the kingdom. Right. And you know, when Pope Benedict preached about the kingdom, he preached about it in a more powerful way than I think any figure in the 2000 years of Christianity has. Wow. Where he said in 2000, the kingdom of God is God. Hmm. It means God exists, that God is not the ultimate cause or this faraway deist reality who creates the world but then detaches himself from it. That God is the foremost reality in any human life. And for Benedict, he lived in that kingdom and he spent his whole life trying to get us to recognize that the king is here and we're actually members of the royal family and our extraordinary dignity flows from that summons from that entrance into the kingdom, and from the eternal communion to which that kingdom leads. Most of us in the church have never met Pope Benedict. I know the three of you each have, and we've been honored to be joined by guests who knew him quite well. And to hear anecdotes and to hear um, just these humanizing stories about Pope Benedict. We also know these different anecdotes. He loved cats, he liked Orange Fanta, just hearing different traits about him um, to get to know him more as a person. But he famously in the media had this reputation as God's Rottweiler. Um, I'd like to address that again, just because I think that's on the forefront of a lot of our viewers' minds, that reputation as, as cold and stern. Um, but that's not what we heard from people who knew him well. And how would you describe Pope Benedict's personality in him as a man? Well, I didn't know him that well. I, I preferred his taste in theology to either soft drinks or <laughs> pets, I would have to say. So I, I don't, I'm more content with no that. No comment. Uh, 
But that was a, a, a caricature that was that applied to him, but it applied to the faith more generally. Hmm. The idea that if the faith says something is wrong, if the faith says something is right, that diminishes me. It makes me less of who I am. It takes away my freedom. And because he was the one who was to defend the faith, he got that more than others. And to be frank, there was a little bit of anti-German. I mean, you know, the, the number one villain for most Hollywood films in history is a German person. Hmm. And so that was there was a bit of that. Uh, so we should be careful in that Joseph Ratzinger was not that kind of person. He was a very courteous gentleman. He was very kind. He was very engaging. But let's apply that to the faith in general. The church is not a Rottweiler. Hmm. And the caricature that was labeled, or that was leveled at him, pardon me, was partly for the whole church. Hmm. And he bore that as one of the more prominent members. And the church isn't like that. And he wasn't, and please God, isn't like that. So, and I think, to be honest, when he became Pope and when he traveled, one of the most important trips that I covered was his 2010 trip to Great Britain. Mm. And there was a sustained campaign for months, even saying he should be arrested when he came. It was, it was, it was so hostile. And he came, and at the end of it, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, when he left, said, you have stopped and made us think. And so when people got to know him, they saw much more than that. So that's why I would say. One of the few things missing from his trip in 2010, that there were no popery songs. I mean, it, it, <laughs> old traditions of anti-Catholicism were And that's very, a, he, he, he was a symbol of more than just himself, I think. Exactly. Rather than a Rottweiler, he was a lamb, very much like the Lamb of God he served. He was meek and humble of heart. That calumny against him mm -hmm. was mainly because he had to correct theologians who were veering from the truth of the faith. And he tried to do so with meekness, but nevertheless, they often controlled the narrative and they said that they were persecuted and that he was the one coming after them. But what we see in him is he always did so with great professional respect for people with whose ideas he disagreed because he respected them as persons, even though he called their ideas um, wayward. Mm. And one of the things that I loved about Pope Benedict, and I wrote about it in a column that will come out today in the National Catholic Register, is when he assumed the papacy, he had a conversion, very much like his theological mm. mentor, St. Augustine, 1,600 years before, where St. Augustine went from writing these massive tomes to having to give homilies to ordinary people and care for widows and everything else, and that's what Pope Benedict needed to do when he assumed the papacy. His theological writing was now totally focused on helping people like us mm -hmm. to come to know Christ much better. He could even teach eight-year-olds about the truths of the faith. And so that showed his real character, this person gently mm -hmm. capable of leading even children to the child born for us in Bethlehem. That's beautiful. I, I might add Math one about that is that if he hadn't been so smart, he would have been better loved. By, and what I mean by that is that when people know that you can't win an argument because you just can't win an argument, then you start to level insults. And there are certain figures hmm. along the way. In, in the United States, we had the late Cardinal Francis George, and no one could win an argument. Some people are just more brilliant than everybody else around them, and Joseph Ratzinger was that his whole life long. And part of that frustration is that, well, if I can't win an argument, I can attack the man's motives. And he would know uh, that the worst of all arguments is the ad hominem argument, and he spent a good part of his life <laughs> dealing with that. Matthew, how well, would you describe Well, him? in addition to uh, the love of cats and Fanta, we also have to add Christmas cookies. He, he, he had a great passion for Christmas cookies and Mozart. That I can agree with. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no one can argue with that. <laughs> But you're right, he was always the smartest person in the room, regardless of the room he was in. <laughs> and the other aspect, though, is for him, there was, because of his genius, because mm -hmm. of the depth of his learning, and also, I would argue, his prayer life, he was also a profoundly prophetic figure. We go back to the 60s and to the 70s, his warnings about where we were headed, mm -hmm. all of it has come true. You can go back to almost any of his writings where he was talking about the, the loss of an authentic sense of freedom. 
truth and love. And I want to direct our viewers' attention to St. Peter's Square, where they are now bringing out the body of Pope Benedict XVI. We'll be right back to that shortly. Um, and I just also, it's important to note that Pope Benedict's remains will lie in the crypt of St. Peter's Basilica in the same tomb where St. John Paul II was initially buried. Um, what's the significance to that? Well, that tomb, uh, we have one of the experts here, but that tomb was actually used by St. John the Twenty-Third before. In our tradition, no one can be buried in a church until they're beatified. So they're below and then they come up above. And here we see the, uh, yes. the coffin emerging. And Father Langey will take us through the dynamics of the, of the crypt under St. Peter's. So St. Peter's tomb is right underneath the main altar of the level there some of the first popes were buried right around him the book of the popes written in the 530s describes that and then many of the modern popes are buried in that lower level of st peter's which was the original level of the basilica built by constantine in the 320s that existed all the way up until it was dismantled in 1506 for the present basilica that we have and so buried very close to him will be now blessed john paul the first uh, St. Christine of Sweden, mm -hmm. uh, Pope Innocent the uh, Third is buried right down there. St. Paul the Sixth is going to be buried right next to him. I think there's great fittingness to the fact that he's going to be placed in the tomb of the where once lay the Pope who convened the Second Vatican Council, yes. St. John the Twenty-Third. He was a great paritas at the Second Vatican Council. Then of the one who summoned him from Munich Freising here to the Vatican to work at his side, St. John Paul II. And we can pray here, as I will, that just as John the Twenty-Third and St. John Paul II were eventually elevated into the upper basilica mm -hmm. after their beatifications, mm -hmm. that the same thing will happen to the one born to Mark on Ill, August, uh, April 16th, 1927. I, we could hear some light applause in St. Peter's Square as they brought out Pope Benedict's body. Um, again, and the work. body's lying there now. And we remember mm -hmm. that scene, don't we, from the uh, funeral of St. John Paul II. And uh, it's traditional that the Book of the Gospels, which is placed over a bishop's head when he's ordained, is then placed on a cardinal's tomb, or card, pardon me, a cardinal's cassock. And on the right-hand side there, you see his longtime secretary, that's Archbishop Georg Ganswein, who has put the uh, Book of the Gospels there. And if I'm not mistaken, that was also uh, Bishop Guido Marini, his uh, longtime. Bishop Marini's um, successor as Master of Ceremonies was opposite Archbishop Ganswein. Yes. And the faithful will be praying the rosary leading up to the funeral mass, which again will be presided over by Pope Francis. Something else that we know today, a peal of church bells will ring across Germany in mourning for Pope Benedict today. The bells of all Catholic churches of the 27 dioceses in Germany are expected to toll at 11 a.m. Um, the White House ha will be uh, represented by its ambassador to the Holy See, Joseph Donnelly. Um, there are only two official state delegations, those of Italy and of Germany, who will be attending the funeral. It will be a, a papal funeral mass, maybe more simple compared well, to others. Well, the big difference is that because Pope Benedict is retired, he's not a head of state who's died. Uh, when his predecessors died, they were heads of state, so there's a kind of a protocol about other state delegations. And of course, you had that astonishing scene 17 years ago, where it was the largest gathering of heads of state in the history of the world. I think it was like over 150 delegations came for that, but that's the difference this time. But obviously, he's a German, and he this is his adopted country, so those countries are uh, represented. Something that should be noted, obviously, we've Pope Benedict has been Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI in the nearly 10 years of his retirement. Um, but now throughout history, he will be Pope Benedict XVI. That's right. Going forward, he will be remembered simply as Pope Benedict. Uh, but one thing, too, is that what we were just talking about, we have diplomatic delegations, not in the same scale uh, that we would for a normal papal funeral. It's just a slight reminder again of how different this funeral mass is. Yes. 
absolutely. Uh, you know, again, obviously he was the first pope in nearly 600 years to resign from the papal office. I'd like to just kind of hear our reflections on that. Yesterday, uh, Patrick Kelly, the Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus, was remarking about how that was really a sign of his humility, which is a word that's been coming up over and over again in describing Pope Benedict. I had the chance yesterday to write an article for the National Catholic Register, which is up on ncregister.org now. The, he did it based on his prayer with the Lord. He was not making that call spontaneously on his own. In prayer, he said, in conscience, which he defined as an inner organ of sensitivity to God's voice, he heard the Lord say, and now is the time for love of the church, for good of the church, to lay down the tasks of the Petrine office in order to take up a new duty, praying for the entire church. And so with great courage and love for the church, mm -hmm. he chose that. He heard the criticisms. St. John Paul II said very famously at the end of his life, if Christ didn't come down from the cross, I'm not going to give up the Petrine duty. I will see it through to the end. And he heard that, and Pope Benedict said um, that I am not coming down from the cross because it takes a lot of pain and suffering to do something that 590, for 598 years no pope has ever done. Likewise, he heard the criticisms that a father never gives up his fatherhood because that seems like a deadbeat father who abandons his family. He said, fathers when they age can't do everything, the heavy lifting, for example, that they would have done when they were 30 or 40. Their sons need to take up those types of tasks, but he's always a father, he's praying and he's loving his family. And so when Pope Benedict made that heroic choice to renounce the papacy for the good of the church, he was doing something consistent with his entire life, which was to hear God's voice and to obey the Lord, even when the Lord was asking him to do something very difficult. How do you serve? His life was one always of service, and I think we had yesterday in the general audience this uh, continuation, the conclusion of a lot of reflections on the part of Pope Francis on discernment, on spiritual accompaniment, on spiritual direction, but also this key of discernment. We know that Benedict was not somebody who is going to make a, a spur of the moment decision. Mm -hmm. He reflected on, on this for a long time. Mm -hmm. But then he reached the conclusion, how can I best serve the church? How can I best serve God and his church? Mm -hmm. And he reached the conclusion that by, by resigning, he would best serve. This is how he could serve. This is how he could help the church in retirement, knowing that he did not have the strength to continue on to carry the burden of the papacy of a billion souls on his shoulders. I would add one more thing to the humility of which Father Roger spoke about. And I would recommend the article. It's very... Uh, ncregister.com for the, for the record. Com. Mm -hmm. Did he say .org? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, dot .com. But on the question of humility, I'll, I'll put it in a provocative way, then I'll explain. If you don't like what Pope Benedict did, he would be okay with that. Mm -hmm. Because he was always very careful to distinguish the truths of the faith from his own understanding of them his beautiful books, Jesus of Nazareth, the three volumes, he said right up at the beginning, right. anybody can disagree with me, these are my views, I believe them, but I'm not proposing them as Pope, and if you wish to disagree, you're free. So there are many of our viewers, and there are some on this panel, perhaps too in some of our days, think, I wish he hadn't done that. Hmm. And he would not say you have to say I did the right thing. He explained with great simplicity why he did it, and, but he was, part of his humility was he allowed people, as it were, the freedom to take a different view. He obviously is a very bright man. I would defer to him. He's a very prayerful man. I'd certainly defer to him there. So I don't have reason to think he made a mistake. But if viewers didn't like the decision he reached, he was very open to saying, well, I did the best I could with, by my lights. And if you disagree, you disagree. But for a man who so often took criticism so well, yes. when, as his secretary, Archbishop Gunsvine, who we just saw with the gospel books yes. at his casket, when he was trying to dissuade right. his boss, his friend, <laughs> his mentor, from the decision to renounce the papacy, Pope Benedict said back to him, listen, it's not a question to be disputed. 
This yes, is a firm decision that I have made after prayer together with the Lord. And in a 2016 book-length interview with his biographer, Peter Zewald, Peter Zewald said, have you regretted it? And he said, no, even for a minute. And then he said, nine, 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 any I N the German, no, 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 not even for a minute. I have done it in prayer together with the Lord, and I'm confident in my decision. And so for somebody who has trusted in the practical wisdom of Joseph Ratzinger and Pope Benedict for decades, for us to say that the decision to renounce the papacy was of a totally different order, I just think that it's inconsistent for us. I mean, here is a person who followed the Lord his entire life, hearing the Lord's voice in such a way that he could spiritually accompany the whole globe. He was making the decision to renounce the papacy out of the same principles and the same behavior that had guided him his entire life. But also the important aspect that remained throughout his retirement, and that is that this was my choice to make. This wasn't imposed on me. You know, in the history of the papacy, we have had popes, some who were, were assassinated, some were murdered. Others were, were forced to flee this, this city. He was saying, this was my choice. I made it in good conscience and of free will. Uh, so in terms of the church law and canonically, in the history of the papacy, those are important things to say, and he was never wavering in, in asserting that, so that there's no question, first about the legitimacy of his resignation, but even, even more, the legitimacy of his successor. Yeah. Something just that would be of interest to our viewers as well is that it's reported his last words on earth were, Lord, I love you. And doesn't that just capture his life, his life of prayer, and again, how Christ-centered, he truly was. Lord, I love you. Um, same words as St. Therese of Lisieux, her final words as well. Would that it be all of our valedictory, right. that we have that prayer to the Lord, loving him, mm -hmm. and as we're going to hear in the gospel today, entrusting ourselves to him. If we do that every day, we don't have to wait until the last second. If every day we're saying, Lord, I love you, and into your hands I commend my spirit, then whenever our last day comes, whether it happens quickly in an accident or when it happens very late at life after suffering, we will have said hundreds if not tens of thousands of times to the Lord, Lord, I love you and into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he comes for us, we'll be ready to enter into his love, having been received by the one to whom we have entrusted everything. Yes, absolutely. Um, again, he was this German pontiff. How did that shape a young Joseph Ratzinger, his life and his pontificate growing up in Germany? Matthew? Well, I, I, I'm just looking at, I think is that the German delegation that should arrive there for the funeral? I, I, it's very bright here, so I can't see, but I think it is the German delegation that's arrived. Uh, for the funeral. He famously described his homeland as not Germany so much as Bavaria, mm -hmm. and not just Bavaria, but what he called the Mozart region of Bavaria, which is near Salzburg. So he very much was immersed in that Catholic culture, the Bavarian traditions, the music of that mm -hmm. area. And in a sense, he had an experience that uh, was a very beautiful, still intact Catholic culture when he was born in 1927. His parents preserved it for him, although by 1933, things took a very ominous turn in Germany, and they never really returned to that even after the war. Uh, so he was, in a certain sense, he was a gift from, a, from a, a culture that was passing away, and you could see in many of his personal reflections, he took for granted things that the rest of us have to learn about in terms of the coherence of family, of village, of the parish church, of music, of study, and all of that. So he was very German in the way that his predecessor brought the best of a very noble Polish tradition. This was an authentic Catholic culture. This was not exclusive to Bavaria. I mean, you grew up, I know, in a strong Catholic family. The Catholic ethos, the that you, it is part of your DNA, it is what you are breathing, it, it is part of every day of your life, something that we have lost in many ways in culture today. I have a, a piece coming out for the Catholic News Agency, it's a sort of a, a selection of readings from Joseph Ratzinger, mm. books that are accessible. And 
I'm going to torture our audience a little bit. There was a, two theologians, Hans Urs von Balthasar and Henri de Lubach. And, and von Balthasar once wrote uh, about de Lubach's many, many writings that standing before this collection is like standing in front of a primeval forest. When we look at the 60-plus books of Joseph Ratzinger, when we look at the what, some 1,300 academic articles, the encyclicals, it's not so much like in, standing in front of a primeval forest as much as it is this Baroque palace. Baroque, and, and each room, uh, right. the thousands of rooms, holds different masterpieces because you can keep finding one masterpiece after another from Joseph Ratzinger. But throughout it all is the music of Mozart. Hmm. He was a truly Baroque figure in the best sense of the word, of the meticulous, the the precision of the music, but also the beauty of it. And so much of Baroque music was put to the glory of God. We think of Vivaldi and others and Gabrielli. This is Joseph Ratzinger, and that's, I think, in many ways, how he reflected that Bavarian life. So for the first six years of his life, as we heard, he was growing up in Bavaria really in its heyday. And there he learned beauty, as we've heard. He also learned goodness. He learned truth. Those three great transcendentals. And in that culture, he was nursed, we could say, in the goodness of the faith, that the faith is something that transforms culture in a positive direction. He never lost that sense. And in the, in, in the midst of the brutality of the Nazis, and then the sort of the harm that has come from a lot of radical secularist tendencies and culture, he was constantly trying to wake us up to remind us of the beauty that we're squandering when we make a choice to marginalize the faith and marginalize believers. He was always trying to take the goodness, the beauty, and the truth of the faith and put it in the center of human life. And for that, we owe him huge thanks. Absolutely. Again, for our viewers, you are watching our live special coverage of the funeral mass of Pope Benedict the 16th. It will be underway here shortly in St. Peter's Square. Benedict's body has been brought out and the faithful here are gathered and praying. Of course, there's the nativity scene still out here. Pope Benedict died um, within the octave of Christmas. And so how fitting that he liked Christmas cookies. He did like Christmas. Everybody likes Christmas, I think. Uh, Especially but, the it, it, yeah. but uh, today, you know, it's the day before Epiphany, right. which is still celebrated here mm -hmm. on the 6th of January. And one of the things that's liturgically suggestive about that is that Benedict had an enormous respect for other ways of thinking, not just Orthodox or Protestant Christians, but philosophers, scientists, physicists, uh, and pagan wisdom. And in his homilies on Epiphany, hmm. he would regard, okay, these men came, they didn't, know, they didn't know the revelation to Israel, but they knew something, and they were courageous enough to follow it. And so in a certain sense, Epiphany is a very fitting model for his engagement uh, with the world, and his homilies talked about that. And he was one who uh, understood the value of seeing the goodness in other things, which you'd think is a default setting for everybody, but it really isn't. And certainly if you grew up in 1930s Germany, you might be suspicious of what you're being presented with, but he managed to overcome that. And so Epiphany, tomorrow's feast, is, um, is fitting. And I would just make it just a logistical observation. Mm -hmm. He died on December 31st. St. Peter's is used on January 1st for the Feast of Mary, Mother of God. It's mm -hmm. used on the 6th. So the man of the liturgy had to be sort of squeezed in. <laughs> they brought him on Monday down here, and they have to bury him on Thursday because, and he would like that, that, you know, the, the basilica exists for the great solemn feast, and he's going to squeeze himself in between those two. Well, you had a piece in the National Catholic Register. I did. Uh, on the liturgical reality liturgical of, of, of Well, Benedict. because one of the things that he remarked on his whole life long was that he was born on Holy Saturday, and he said... Obviously, he didn't control that, but it's, it had marked my identity. And uh, he was a man of the liturgy and the liturgical culture. And, you know, when he would come for an occasion, and he was invited everywhere for everything, when he came, he would often say, I'm just going to take my lead from the mass texts of the day, from the readings of the day, and let myself be guided by the liturgy. So I think it would please him that when he died, the organizers of all the ceremonies had to say, well, we've got two solemn feasts and we've got to <laughs> respect those, and they have. Well, Catherine, uh, earlier this week you read uh, a note that 
the yes. young Joseph Ratzinger wrote yes. about the Christ child. Yes. And to consider again this octave of Christmas, the wonder of Christmas, that there was a, a wonder in this young Joseph Ratzinger about the Christ child, about how he loved the Christ child. That is a, a, a sense of wonder. It's a sense of innocence, mm-hmm. but it's also a sense of childlike trust that continued all the way to his last comment, his last words, Jesus, I love you. Absolutely. How appropriate is that and how horribly misunderstood that can be where in, in a technocratic culture like we have today, right. uh, misunderstanding the idea of a simple faith as being simplistic. As a priest, I always was moved to have the privilege to celebrate funeral masses during the Christmas octave and during the Easter octave. During the Christmas octave, we ponder the meaning of Jesus becoming one of us. Mm-hmm. And in one of our great English Christmas hymns, we, we sing, born so that man no more may die. Mm-hmm. That Jesus came into the world in order to bring us into his world. He mm-hmm. took on our humanity to make us partakers of his divinity. And to be able to celebrate this funeral mass on the 11th day of Christmas Mm -hmm. is something in which we're going to be pondering the one who, for whom Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, gave his entire life, the one risen from the dead, the one who called himself the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. And we pray that just as he was born so that man might no more die, that Joseph Ratzinger will experience that eternal life in the presence of God with us forever. And if I can uh, just take that one step further, I don't, people don't choose when they die, but great souls do choose when they die, I think. And uh, John Paul II died on the eve of the octave day of Easter, Divine Mercy Sunday. And Joseph Ratzinger always regarded himself as a collaborator, but one, one step down. And so it would have been a bit uh, some effrontery to die also in the octave of Easter. So he died on the eve of the octave of Christmas, which is a remarkable symmetry. And it would be like that he always called, he started off his pontificate saying, you know, after the great John Paul. So John Paul took mm-hmm. the octave of Easter and uh, Benedict took the octave of Christmas. And so that, that tell me if we have it's to die in the octave of Pentecost. That's going to be the only <laughs> one that's, that's left. And if we live long enough, someone will have to settle for the 32nd week in ordinary time. But it's remarkable, isn't it, that they would have died on those uh, very similar liturgical there days. There are no coincidences in God's no, providence. No, there are no yeah. coincidences right. in God's Absolutely. providence. My mother's favorite line that she quotes from John Paul II all the time. Hmm. Imagine that you are Joseph Ratzinger and... By the time you have your, your doctorate, you've you got your habilitation on Bonaventure. You are prefect for the congregation of the doctrine of the faith. You are arguably the most learned man. We talked last night, was he the most learned man in the world? Hmm. Uh, we, we talk in history about somebody like Desiderius Erasmus, who was considered to have all the knowledge possible in his lifetime. You have all of that knowledge. You can ponder the deepest mysteries of the faith, but somehow you have not lost that simple love for Jesus. That strikes me as one of his greatest accomplishments in life, not to have lost that. To be both, to be intellectual and simple. They don't contradict each other. And again, talking about, you hear this Ave Regina being prayed behind us as well. One thing as we're preparing to begin the funeral mass here for Pope Benedict XVI, for viewers at home who could not travel here, and I've heard from so many viewers who just wish they could have been here. I think so many people at home wish they could be present here at the funeral mass. And and I want our viewers to know we have been praying for them here. How can people who are not here participate in this funeral mass? Pope Benedict used to always talk about two things together. The Ars Celebrandi, the way to pray the mass, which is to own the prayers in a sense. Mm -hmm. Normally when we speak, we think before we speak. But in the church's liturgical prayers, the words precede us. And so the real work of prayer is to make those words our own and really mean them as we say them to the Lord. So I'd really first urge everyone to 
allow their soul to align itself to the words of the church's right. The second was what he called, with the words of the Second Vatican Council, actuosa participatio, a Latin expression that means active, devout, pious participation in the liturgy. So it's we're asking readers, not uh, viewers, not to be spectators, but actually participants in the scene. And the extraordinary reality of our faith is whether you're in Birmingham, Alabama, whether mm -hmm. you're in San Diego, mm -hmm. whether you're up in Crookston, Minnesota, or whether you're on 48 Dana Street in Lowell, Massachusetts, like my parents, mm -hmm. they're able to join us here in prayer, lifting up our hearts to God, just like the tens of thousands presently assembled behind us in St. Peter's Square. So, Ars Celebrandi Actuosa Participatio, really meaning what we say and devoutly cooperating in the prayer of the church is what Pope Benedict himself would have asked everyone watching today. Mm. This is a, a nice opportunity to... You mentioned your mother because I mentioned mine and now <laughs> Father Roger mentioned his mother. So Matthew, well, how's she, Mrs. Bunsen? She's is, deceased. She is deceased. Yeah, I know that. Uh, <laughs> Ten years now. Uh, big fan of Benedict, I, I she would was, say. Yeah. Always was. And of John Paul II, a convert. But this is a, an opportunity, I think, and I'd love to hear both of you reflect on the communion of saints and its relevance today. Well, we see an example of it right behind us mm -hmm. in St. Peter's Square. On the columns of the arms of St. Peter's Square, you've got 140 saints who are enveloping everybody. They're an image of what the letter to the Hebrews calls the great cloud of witnesses who are praying right alongside of us. And when you look at the facade of St. Peter's, you have Christ right there in the center, risen from the dead. Pope Francis is about to come out from underneath Christ as a proclamation of Jesus' risen reality. And then over the pillars and the pilasters of the facade, you have the apostles who are the public face of the church proclaiming the fundamental teaching of the church that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again for each of us. The uh, Benedict used to say when he was with his books reading Bonaventure, Augustine, Leo the Great, Gregory the Great, that he said, I'm with my friends. Hmm. And uh, that's an intellectual friendship, but it's also a spiritual friendship. And he's going to be buried with his friends, you know, that uh, not all of his predecessors would have thought of Gregory the Great or Leo the Great as their friends, but he did. And so he's going home to his friends. Just one point on how to participate. We have learned there's silver linings to even the darkest clouds and this horrible pandemic that caused so much disruption in our mm -hmm. liturgical life meant that a lot of people had to learn to pray at home mm -hmm. watching what they had been to in person for their lives. And so uh, that disruption was a terrible suffering not to be able to worship God as we're supposed to. It was necessary, but it was a necessary evil. Uh, and people have learned that. So I think probably there's a lot of our viewers who will know, as they did in 17 years ago, how to pray while watching mm -hmm. a Mass on, uh, on television. And there we see the risen Christ. There it is, the tapestry uh, at the front of St. Peter's. Which was a favorite painting of Pope Benedict the at 16th. At Castel Gandolfo, which is where he would go during the summer to get outside of Rome when it was most hot and humid. Yes, yeah. So that's a special image that was brought for this uh, occasion, okay? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Pope Francis tends to favor staycations uh, here. Local. He doesn't go to yes. yeah, so. There's been a lot of discussion of are we possibly at the funeral of a saint, at a, the funeral of a future doctor of the church? But as we said, today is his funeral. It's a time for mourning. It's a time for remembering him and for praying for him. And Jesus told us very clearly, don't judge. So most people understand that don't judge somebody's soul negatively because that's left for God because we can never know everybody's motivations. But I think it likewise means don't judge somebody positively until the church does her job, mm -hmm. investigates his life for heroic faith, hope, and love, sees what God does through uh, prayers made through that person's intercession. If God works some great miracles, it's almost a sign from heaven that mm -hmm. he is among the catalog of the saints. And so today we don't judge Joseph mm -hmm. Ratzinger and Pope Benedict in a negative direction mm -hmm. or in a positive mm -hmm. direction. We entrust him to the Lord who loved us all, that he didn't spare his own son, but sent him into our world in order to take our place on death row and blow open mm -hmm. the doors to his house in heaven. Mm -hmm. We also have a, we're, this is, I mean, this is a pope, it's unusual, but everybody knows how to 
live this reality because we've all been to funerals of people we think are in heaven. Hmm. And not just have a sentiment. I had one. I did a funeral for a saint a month ago, my own godmother, 99 and a half years old. She must have been a saint if she was your godmother. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the first to have said that. Uh, but everybody in my family saw her holiness and her fidelity. Uh, none of us would think anything other, but we still have a funeral, and we pray a funeral like a funeral. So we don't have to sort of, uh, this, is, this is a pope who's a famous man, but every Christian disciple has been to a funeral of someone who we have an interior confidence is in heaven, and that is how it should be. You know, we shouldn't go to funeral mass and think, my goodness gracious, you know, we're trembling. I mean, fear and trembling is how we work out our salvation, but when we go to a funeral mass, we should have that interior. It's, it's, fit. it's how it should be. We should want to go to a funeral mass mm -hmm. and have that interior confidence that some a grand figure of history like Pope Benedict or an ordinary person known to us but not to the world is in heaven. That's how we should want to be. Mm -hmm. But he took the time to reflect on what was coming. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we'll talk more, I know, about eschatology and other things. But here he was in retirement. He, he had this letter that was just published after his death, written in 2006. But over those years, we know that he continually was reflecting on what he referred to as the day will come when I enter that dark door of death. Mm -hmm. But then he had the, the courage. He was not afraid of it. He was ready for it. Mm -hmm. But it's one thing to be ready, but also not to be afraid. He was mm -hmm. not afraid. Why? Because he said that the judge who will judge him is my friend. And he knows that A, his judge will be fair. Mm -hmm. but his judge also loves him. And you have to remember that popes, you mentioned earlier, a very good point, that only Pope Benedict knew the burden Pope Francis carried because no one else knows it. One thing that the popes share in common is they start their ministry under that terrifying, terrible, awful, but <laughs> awesome depiction of Michelangelo's Last Judgment. That's how they start. In the Sistine Chapel. In the Sistine Chapel. And so they know something about judgment that none of us know because they begin under that. And that that judgment of Michelangelo's masterful depiction is terrifying but also comforting if you have faith. If you don't have faith, it's just terrifying. Uh, but he had a faith, and so that was the judge he was ready to face because it's where he began, the pontificate. But Pope Benedict likewise showed us how to live a happy death. Yes. A few days before God came for him, he was anointed by his secretary, Archbishop Gunsfein. Just like every Catholic around the world has the same privilege to be able to call their pastor or one of the parochial vicars or any priest at a hospital to be able to come and prepare them well for death. What a great example of the power of the sacraments and of Jesus working through the sacraments we see in him. And we see now Pope Francis is coming out. He is being wheeled out in a wheelchair right now as we're getting closer and closer to the beginning of the funeral mass for Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. As Mass is about to begin here in St. Peter's Square, is there anything else of a special significance that our viewers should know um, about St. Peter's in particular? coming here. One of the things I just mentioned is that the cardinals we see on either side of them, you'd mentioned how Pope Francis knows Pope uh, Benedict well. These are, these, there are, many of them have come to bury a friend mm -hmm. and a man that they have enormous affection for. So it's, it's a grand ecclesial event, but it's a personal event. And as far as the square, Peter, Father Roger can tell us a little bit about that. We're, we are now beginning with the entrance antiphon, so we'll save the square for a little bit later. But some viewers may be wondering why Pope Francis came out in his papal cassock. That is because he will be giving the homily at today's Mass, but because of his difficulties, both with his legs as well as with his back, he is uh, not going to be the principal celebrant of this Mass. That's going to be the Dean of the College of Cardinals, Giovanni Battista Ray, whom we will see coming out at the end of this procession. And we take you now to the funeral Mass of Pope Emeritus Benedict the Sixteenth. So now the entrance antiphon is being sung in which we pray to the Lord, eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him, that great prayer in which we entrust our loved ones to the Lord, 
and then we sing together Psalm 65. To you our praise is due in Zion, O God. To you we pay our vows who hear our prayer. To you all flesh will come with its burden of sin. Too heavy for us are offenses, but you wipe them away. Blessed he whom you choose and call to dwell in your courts. We are filled with the blessings of your house, of your holy temple. You keep your pledge with wonders, O God, our Savior, the hope of all the earth and of far distant isles. Traditional colors for a funeral mass are black and purple. In some countries like the United States, have an adult similarly to use white vestments. But for a funeral of a uh, pope, red is the traditional color. So you are seeing the cardinals of the church dressed in red processing in now. seeing the Eastern Patriarchs process on in.
Cardinal Giovanni Battista Ray is now incensing the altar in which he is praying that our prayers will rise up to God like incense. He was the head of the Congregation for Bishops for the first half of the pontificate of Pope Benedict, and he is the dean of the College of Cardinals, which is why he was asked by Pope Francis to be the principal celebrant of this Requiem Mass. Francis will now begin the Mass with the sign of the cross and the greeting in Latin. In nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pax Vobis. Et cum Spiritu Tuo. Fratres, aios camus pecata nostra, utatissimus al sacra misteria celebrata. So as to prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. We pray together, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Francis prays, may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Now we will sing the Kyrie eleison, in which we ask God the Father, Lord, have mercy. Ask Christ, God the Son, Christ have mercy. Ask God the Holy Spirit, Lord, have mercy.
Oremos. Let us pray. Deus, que o God, who in your wondrous providence chose your servant Benedict to preside over your church, grant, we pray, that having served as the vicar of your son on earth, he may be welcomed by him into eternal glory who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading will be from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 29, verses 16 to 19. It will be read in Spanish. Lectura del libro de Isaías. Esto dice el Señor. The Lord says this. Is the potter no better than the clay? Can something that was made say of its maker? He did not make me. Or pot say of the potter? He is a fool. In a short time, a very short time, shall not Lebanon become fertile land and fertile land turn into a forest. That day the deaf will hear the words of a book, and after shadow and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see, but the lowly will rejoice in the Lord even more, and the poorest exult in the Holy One of Israel. the Lord thanks be to God and now we will hear the most famous psalm sung Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd I lack for nothing there's nothing I shall want Dominus pascit me et nihil me my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. In restful waters, he leads me to revive my drooping spirit. He guides me along the right path. He is true to his name. If I should walk in the valley of darkness, no evil would I fear. You are there with me, with your crook and your staff. With these you give me comfort. You have prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. My head you have anointed with oil. My cup is overflowing. Surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house shall I dwell forever and ever. Namet si ambula vero in valle umbre mortis non time bo mala. Quoniam tu me cumes. Calix meus 
the beautiful chanting of the psalm in Latin, we will now hear from the first letter of St. Peter in English. Our reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy has given us a new birth as his sons by raising Jesus Christ from the dead, so that we have a sure hope and the promise of an inheritance that can never be spoiled or soiled and never fade away, because it is being kept for you in the heavens. Through your faith, God's power will guard you until the salvation which has been prepared is revealed at the end of time. This is a cause of great joy for you, even though you may for a short time have to bear being plagued by all sorts of trials, so that when Jesus Christ is revealed, your faith will have been tested and proved like gold. Only it is more precious than gold, which is corruptible even though it bears testing by fire. And then you will have praise and glory and honor. You did not see him, yet you love him. And still, without seeing him, you are already filled with a joy so glorious that it cannot be described, because you believe, and you are sure of the end to which your faith looks forward, that is, the salvation of your souls. Thanks to God for the word of the Lord. And now we will sing the Alleluia, in which we use the Hebrew word, praise the Lord, three times. And then the gospel verse will be, it is my Father's will that whoever sees the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life.
hear from the Gospel of St. Luke. The initial will be in Latin. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lectio Sancti Evangelii secundum Luca. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. And now we will hear in Italian. In quel tempo, uno dei malfattori One of the criminals hanging there abused Jesus. Are you not the Christ, he said. Save yourself and us as well. But the other criminal spoke up and rebuked him. Have you no fear of God at all, he said. You got the same sentence as he did. But in our case, we deserved it. We are paying for what we did but this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, the criminal said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, indeed I promise you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and with the sun eclipsed, a darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. The veil of the temple was torn right down the middle, and when Jesus had cried out in a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And with these words, he breathed his last. The Gospel of the Lord Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Father will preach the homily in Italian. Padre, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. These were the final words spoken by the Lord on the cross. His last breath, as it were, which summed up what had been his entire life, was a ceaseless self-entrustment into the hands of his Father. His hands were those of forgiveness and compassion, healing and mercy, anointing and blessing, which led him also to entrust himself into the hands of his brothers and sisters. The Lord opened to the individuals and their stories that he encountered along the way. 
allowed himself to be shaped by the Father's will. He shouldered all the consequences and hardships entailed by the gospel, even to seeing his hands pierced for love. See my hands, he said to Thomas, and to each of us. Pierced hands that constantly reach out to us, inviting us to recognize the love that God has for us and to believe in that love. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. This is the invitation and program of life that Jesus quietly inspires in us. Like a potter, he wishes to shape the heart of every pastor until it is attuned to the heart of Christ Jesus. Attuned in grateful devotion, in service to the Lord and to his people, a service born of thanksgiving for a completely gra gracious gift. You belong to me, you belong to them, the Lord whispers. You are under the protection of my hands. You are under the protection of my heart. Stay in my hands and give me your hands. Here we see the condescension and the closeness of God, who is ready to entrust himself to the frail hands of his disciples so that they can feed his people and say with him, take and eat, take and drink, for this is my body given up for you. Attuned. Attuned in prayerful devotion, a devotion silently shaped and refined amid the challenges and resistance that every pa pastor must face, entrusting obedience to the Lord's command to feed his flock. Like the master, a shepherd bears the burden of interceding and the strain of anointing his people, especially in situations where goodness must struggle to prevail and the dignity of our brothers and sisters is threatened. In the course of this intercession, the Lord quietly bestows the spirit of meekness that's ready to understand, accept, hope, and risk, notwithstanding any misunderstandings that might result. It's the source of an unseen and elusive fruitfulness, born of his knowing the one in whom he has placed his trust, a trust itself born of prayer and adoration, capable of discerning what's expected of a pastor and shaping his heart and his decisions in, according, in accordance with God's good time. Feeding means loving, and loving also means being ready to suffer, Loving means giving the sheep what's truly good, the nourishment of God's truth, of God's word, the nourishment of his presence. Attuned in devotion sustained by the consolation of the Spirit who always precedes the pastor in his mission. In his passionate effort to communicate the beauty and joy of the gospel, and the fruitful witness of all those who, like Mary, in so many ways stand at the foot of the cross, in the painful yet steadfast serenity that neither attacks nor coerces, in the stubborn but patient hope that the Lord will be faithful to his promise the promise he made to our fathers and to his descendants forever. Holding fast to the Lord's words and to the witness of his entire life, we too, as an ecclesial community, want to follow in his steps and to commend our brother into the hands of the Father. May those merciful hands find his lamp alight with the oil of the gospel that he spread and testified to for his entire life. St. Gregory the Great, at the end of his pastoral rule, urged a friend to offer him this spiritual accompaniment. Amid the shipwreck of the present life, sustain me, I beseech you, by the plank of your prayer, so that since the, my own weight sinks me down, the hand of your merit will raise me up 
Here we see the awareness of a pastor who can't carry alone what in truth he could never carry alone. He can thus commend himself to the prayers and the care of the people entrusted to him. God's faithful people gathered here now accompanies and entrusts to God the life of the one who was their pastor. Like the women at the tomb, we too come with the fragrance of gratitude and the balm of hope in order to show him once more the love that is undying. We want to do this with the same wisdom, tenderness, and devotion that he bestowed upon us over the years. Together, we want to say, Father, into your hands, we commend his spirit. Benedict, faithful friend of Jesus the bridegroom, may your joy be complete as you hear his voice now and forever. his predecessor throughout this homily. The other is, and Father, you can correct me, but I don't think there were any extemporanea, uh, there was no extemporaneous uh, citations or, or references or statements by Pope Francis. He stuck completely to the text. And again, we will have more commentary and thoughts following um, the funeral mass at the conclusion of the mass. It's. Um, a chilly and foggy morning here at St. Peter's, and again, a historic moment as Pope Benedict's successor is the one to preside over his own funeral mass. We take you back now to St. Peter's Square. We will now have the prayer of the faithful prayed to the Lord in several languages. Brothers and sisters, let us pray to God our Father, who in his great mercy has given us rebirth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We sing in Latin, Dominum Deprecemur, let us pray to the Lord. We pray to you, Lord, hear us. Papst Benedict, der im Herrn in German, we pray for Pope Emeritus Benedict, who has fallen asleep in the Lord. May the eternal shepherd receive him into his kingdom of light and peace. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, 
for all the pastors of the church. May they fearlessly proclaim in word and deed Christ's victory over evil and death. In Arabic, we pray for leaders of nations and international organizations. May they strive to promote justice and peace with wisdom and foresight. In Portuguese, we pray for our brothers and sisters in need. May God's love open our hearts to compassion and concern for the poor and for the least of our brothers and sisters. And in Italian, we implore for us gathered to celebrate the defeat of death by the triumph of the Lord Jesus. May it be for us a leaven of hope as we await the coming of the kingdom. The Holy Father concludes, God, our Father, lover of life, Hear the prayers we raise to you with faith in the risen Lord for Pope Emeritus Benedict and for the needs of the church and the world. Grant us a share in fellowship with you in the heavenly Jerusalem where sorrow and tears will be no more. Through Christ our Lord. Thirty-nine hundred priests from all over the world who are celebrating this mass, together with four hundred and fifty bishops. chant. We have part of the traditional Dies Irae, which was the sequence for requiem masses for centuries. The part that we lift up in prayer to the Lord today asks, Lord Jesus Christ, King of glory, free the souls of all the faithful departed from infernal punishment in the deep pit. Free them from the mouth of the lion. Don't let Tartarus swallow them or let them fall into darkness. But may the standard bearer, St. Michael, lead them into the holy light that once you promised to Abraham and to his descendants. O Lord, we offer you sacrifices and prayers of praise. Accept them on behalf of those souls whom we remember today. Let them, O Lord, pass from death to life as you once promised Abraham and his descendants. It is being sung by the Sistine Choir. If you've just tuned in with the chalice is Cardinal Giovanni Battista Ray, the Dean of the College of Cardinals and the prefect of the Congregation for Bishops from 2001 to 2010, including for the first four years of Pope Benedict's papacy.
Orate fratres. Cardinal Ray prays, pray, brother and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father, and we respond, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Praise in Latin, look with favor on the offerings of your church as she calls on you, O Lord, and by the power of the sacrifice grant that as you placed your servant Benedict as high priest over your flock, so may you set him among the number of your chosen priests in heaven, Christum Dominum Nostrum. Amen. Dominus Vobiscum. And now in the prayer that Catholics around the world know, the dialogue takes place. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just. Our duty and salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as one alone, he accepted death so that we might all escape from dying. As one man, he chose to die so that in your sight, we might all live forever. And so in company with the choirs of angels, we praise you and with joy we proclaim. Coris angelici sociati, te laudamus in gaudio confidentes. Now we will hear, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Cardinal Ray will continue with Eucharistic Prayer 3 in Latin, in which the Church prays, You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. Filitui Domini nostri Jesu Christi, cuius mandato ex misteria celebramus. For in the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. 
a csípite itt mandukát egy zsak amnes. Ak est enim karpus meum, quod probabis tradetur. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessings and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for the many, for the forgiveness of sins. Qui provavis et promultis et fundetur in remissionem peccatorum. Hoc facite in mea commemorationem. of faith, and we pray, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. We continue our prayer. Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, as we look forward to a second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church in recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. Spiritus in veniamor in Christo. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. Con Sanctis Ioanne Baptista et Artemide, et omnibus sanctis, quorum intercessione, perpetuo a te confidimus adiuvare. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Francisco, cum episcopale ordine et universor clero, et omni populo acquisitionis tue. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. Your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant, Pope Emeritus Benedict, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he, who is united with your son in a death like his, may also be one with him in his resurrection, when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There, we hope to enjoy forever 
the fullness of your glory, when you'll wipe away every tear from our eyes, for seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages, and praise you without end, in Christ our Lord, to whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Ab oculis nostris, qui a te secuti es deum nostrum videntes, tibi similes erimus cuncta per secula, et te sine fine laudabimus. Per Christum Dominum nostrum, per quem mundo bona cuncta largeris. We finish the Eucharistic prayer chanting to God through Christ and with him and in him. O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Omnis honor et gloria per omnia secula seculorum. Catholic world responds, Amen. Precetti salutari vos moniti et divina At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, we chant together the Patinos of the Our Father in Latin. taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And Cardinal Ray finished by praying. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. As we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we chant, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Domine Jesu Christe, qui disiste apostolis tuis. Lord Jesus Christ, you who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church. And graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with her will to live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always and with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. There you see those who cared for Pope Benedict, the Memories Domini, Sisters of Communion and Liberation, and on the right, Archbishop Georg Ganswein, the secretary for many years and good friend and spiritual son of Pope Benedict. Now we sing, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Holds up the Eucharistic Lord Jesus and says, 
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. And the church prays, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. the Sistine Choir chants the communion antiphon for a funeral mass. Let perpetual light shine upon him with your saints forever, for you are merciful. And then the verses are taken from Psalm 130. Out of the depth I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. O let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleading. If you, Lord, should mark our guilt, Lord, who would survive? But with you is found forgiveness. For this we revere you. My soul is waiting for the Lord. I count on his word. My soul is longing for the Lord more than watchmen for daybreak. But the watchmen count on daybreak and Israel on the Lord. Because with the Lord there is mercy and fullness of redemption. Israel, indeed, he will redeem from all its iniquity. watching EWTN's live coverage of the funeral mass for Pope Benedict XVI here in St. Peter's Square in Rome. It's now the distribution of the Eucharist for our viewers at home. You can offer a spiritual communion to unite yourself to the mass. Um, but during this time, we're just, we're going to reflect on what Pope Benedict taught us about this sacrament. He wrote a document on the sacrament, Sacramentum Caritatis, the sacrament of charity. What is it? that Pope Benedict XVI, whom we are remembering now, whom we are praying for at this funeral mass, what did he teach us about the sacrament of the Eucharist? In that beautiful document, the sacrament of charity or the sacrament of love, which Jesus used to self-identify when he referred to himself in the apparitions to St. Margaret Mary Alacock in 1675. He said that the Eucharist is a mystery to be believed, a mystery to be celebrated, and a mystery to be lived. Sometimes Catholics can believe that there's greater power in receiving two Advil than in receiving Holy Communion. But Pope Benedict, when he was with the young people in Cologne, Germany for World Youth Day, said to receive Jesus within is like a nuclear reaction that's supposed to take place, that's supposed to transform all of our life, and through that transformation, change the world. He taught over and again that receiving Jesus in Holy Communion is the most consequential thing a human person can do. Uh, you know, Father Roger mentioned about World Youth Day at Cologne. That was one of the few adaptations that Pope Bendick made to World Youth Day from John Paul's the model, which was to introduce adoration at that prayer, the nighttime vigil. And that was one of the most impressive things when you have several hundred thousand or a million people in silent adoration of the most blessed sacrament. Uh, in, a, in a way, that was the... Um, the heart of Benedict's piety was Eucharistic piety, and he was a very effective teacher, not just on the doctrine of the Eucharist, but on how to receive communion, uh, how to prepare yourself for communion, uh, how to adore the Lord in Holy Communion. And I have no doubt, Father mentioned earlier about him receiving the sacrament of the sick, uh, but until he was physically unable, they celebrated a mass, and he would have been sustained by the Eucharist in his last, uh, in his last days. And we know that uh, he rallied just before the end and was able to have Mass in his room at the Sancta Mater Ecclesiae. One aspect, too, about uh, Sacramentum Caritatis and, and the Eucharistic teachings by Pope Benedict was the stress that he also always placed on the worthiness to receive and the sacrament of penance in preparation for that worthiness to receive. And uh, pulling those sacraments together uh, for Benedict, I think, was also very important. He tried to have the whole Catholic world take the gift of the Lord Jesus in, holy, in the Holy Eucharist seriously. 2005, 
he went to a place on the east coast of Italy called Bari, where the Italian Eucharistic Congress was taking place. And he there centered his entire homily on a scene from the early church from the year 304 in modern day Tunisia, a place called Abatine. And there, there were 49 Christians who were warned by the local Roman leader that the decree of the Emperor Diocletian had come out that if they were to convene on Sunday morning for the Eucharist, they would be summarily arrested and sent to Carthage to be executed. He thought that that would be enough, but on Sunday morning at dawn, all 49 Christians there still came together for the Mass, after which they were arrested and they were martyred that day. And when the local Roman leader said, why did you come together after I told you that if you came, I would have no choice but to arrest you? The oldest among them stood forward and said, in Latin, sine dominico, non possibus. Without the little Lord on Sunday, we can't make it. And Pope Francis went back to that scene in his beautiful exhortation on the Holy Eucharist Sacramentum Caritatis to describe the priority of the Lord Jesus in our life, that we can't really live, especially life to the full, without this gift of God himself to us in Holy Communion. And so more than Pope Francis, more than Pope Benedict here at St. Peter's Square, Jesus Christ, their boss, has come down to feed his beloved flock because Jesus didn't consider any nourishment worthy of the human soul other than himself. The, the privilege it is to, to be a priest and to be able to administer the sacrament of the Eucharist. And again, a great reminder how the sacrament of the Eucharist and penance do go hand in hand. I think this is a radical reality of our faith that Pope Benedict taught that we know we're seeing fewer and fewer Catholics share that belief. Um, we've seen the polling, especially in the United States. But again, I think as we're reflecting and remembering Pope Benedict, an opportunity for us all maybe to read his document, Sacramentum Caritatis, to reflect on that. And again, for those who cannot be here, to offer a spiritual communion right now, to unite yourself to this Mass, this historic moment in the life of the Church as uh, Pope Francis presides over the funeral Mass for Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. And we'll go back now to our live coverage of the funeral mass of Pope Benedict the 16th here at St. Peter's Square. Pope Emeritus Benedict right in front of his successor, Pope Francis, and over them the image of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Catholics believe that in Holy Communion we receive the risen body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ under the miracle of the maintained appearances of bread and wine.
You are watching EWTN's live coverage from Rome, the funeral mass for Pope Benedict XVI. This time of silence at the end of Holy Communion is a time of gratitude in which we turn to the Lord who we've received or for whose reception we have prayed and thank him for the gift of his presence in the world. Father leads us in the prayer after Holy Communion. Let us pray. As we receive sacred sustenance from your charity, O Lord, we pray that your servant Benedict, who is a faithful steward of your mysteries on earth, may praise your mercy forever in the glory of the saints. But through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now there will be the final commendation in the farewell. Dear brothers and sisters, in celebrating the sacred mystery, we have opened our minds and hearts to joy-filled hope. With confidence, we now offer our final farewell to Pope Emeritus Benedict and commend him to God, our merciful and loving Father. May the God of our fathers, through Jesus Christ, his only Son, in the Holy Spirit, Lord and giver of life, deliver Pope Emeritus Benedict from death, that he may sing God's praises in the heavenly Jerusalem in expectation of the resurrection of his mortal body on the last day. May the Blessed Virgin Mary, Queen of the Apostles, and Salus Populi Romani, the salvation, the health of the Roman people, intercede before the Eternal Father that he may reveal the face of Jesus' Son to Pope Emeritus Benedict and console the Church on her pilgrimage throughout history as she awaits the Lord's return. Pope Francis will now sprinkle the casket of Pope Francis with holy water and then incense the casket and the body within. And the church now sings from the book of Job, I know that my Redeemer lives. On the last day I shall rise again. In my flesh I shall see God my Savior. I shall see him myself face to face, and my own eyes shall behold him. And in my flesh I shall see God, my Savior. Within my heart I cherish this hope, that in my flesh I shall see God, my Savior. sprinkling the casket of Pope Benedict with holy water, a reminder of his baptism in which he died in Christ on April 16, 1927, and Christ rose from the dead within him. The connection between baptism and the funeral mass is very tight. Many of the symbols used on the day of baptism are used in a funeral mass to point to the fact that in the day of baptism, a Christian dies and Christ rises, and that is the foretaste of what death opens us to. Now Cardinal Ray incenses the casket and the body within as a sign that the mortal remains of a human being are sacred, and asking that just like this incense rises up 
to heaven, so the soul of Pope Benedict may be received into the house of the Father. Francis prays. Gracious Father, we commend to your mercy Pope Emeritus Benedict, whom you made successor of Peter and shepherd of the church, a fearless preacher of your word and a faithful minister of the divine mysteries. Welcome him, we pray, into your heavenly dwelling place to enjoy eternal glory with all your chosen ones. We give you thanks, Lord, for all the blessings that in your goodness you bestowed upon him for the good of your people. Grant us the comfort of faith and the strength of hope. To you, Father, source of life, through Christ the conqueror of death, in the life-giving spirit, we all honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the Sistine Choir chants, may the angels lead you into paradise, may the martyrs come and welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. May choirs of angels welcome you, through Lazarus who is poor no longer, may you have eternal rest. Gospel is taken from the casket in preparation for the casket containing the body of Pope Benedict to be brought inside the Basilica of St. Peter to the lower level, the grotto level, where it will be buried in the same place where prior Pope John Paul II and Pope John XXIII were buried. Papal Chamberlains are the ones now surrounding the casket who will carry Pope Benedict within the Basilica. And the whole church sings together Mary's hymn of praise and thanksgiving to God at the visitation. My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he looks on his servant in her lowliness. Henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty works marvels for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. Puts forth his arm and strength and scatters the proud hearted. He casts down the mighty from their thrones and raises the lowly. He fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away empty. He protects Israel, his servant, remembering his mercy the mercy promised to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever.
are processing back into the Basilica of St. Peter in anticipation of Pope Benedict being brought behind them into the grotto level of the Basilica to be buried. watching EWTN's live coverage of the funeral mass for Pope Benedict XVI. As you can see, his coffin is now being lifted up in St. Peter's Square. It will be taken to St. Peter's Basilica and then to the Vatican Grotto for burial. That will be in a private ceremony, and our understanding is that will be closed off to the media. Uh, Pope Benedict's remains will lie in the crypt of St. Peter's Basilica in the same tomb where St. John Paul II was initially buried. Powerful imagery right now as we see our Pope Benedict XVI, his coffin being brought into St. Peter's Basilica right now. In keeping with uh, papal custom, uh, the, the casket itself is made of cypress. Uh, it will then be placed into another casket, that one made of zinc that will then be sealed and placed within an additional wooden casket before it is lowered into the actual tomb itself uh, in the Vatican Grotto. Again, this is a historic moment in the life of the church as Pope Francis presided over the mass here in St. Peter's for his predecessor, Pope Benedict. Immediate reflections right now as we see this powerful imagery of Pope Benedict's coffin. So the first Christians during the three centuries where Christianity was illegal, used to bring their dead to bury them as close as possible to the tomb of Peter because they believed somewhat superstitiously in what we would call a geographical nepotism, mm. that St. Peter would love his physical neighbors with special predilection after they had died. And so Christians were burying their dead all around St. Peter's tomb. The first popes were buried around him. And now Pope Benedict will follow in the long line of Christian disciples who's, who will be buried close to the first Peter to whom the words of eternal life were given. You could see Pope Francis there standing, watching. It's a very moving image there, watching his predecessor go past. And now he'll make his own act of affection and reverence, I'm sure. Thank you, Pope Benedict, it says there in German. A moving moment. Uh, we saw Pope Francis there, and it came then being a wheelchair wheeled out for him. Again, only the two have a special understanding of each other and the weight of the papacy. There were two official state delegations at the funeral mass, those of Italy and in Germany. And there we can see right now the coffin being lifted of Saint, of Pope Benedict 
the 16th being brought into St. Peter's Basilica. And when Probably. he goes into the Basilica, all those cardinals we saw went in before. They form what might call an honor guard to uh, accompany him one last time. And now they'll carry him into the uh, Basilica where the cardinals, many of whom he made, will salute him. And then the body will be taken down below. And Father, you were talking about... Um, and you'll see Matthew there, there's the art, his secretary there, Archbishop Ganswan is following, and those four ladies are the ones who looked after his household. So that's his family, really, mm -hmm. uh, who are going with him to the burial because his own parents, long deceased, and his brother and sister. So that is his household who's going with Bidding him, him now. Bidding him a final farewell. Yes. And, and Father, you were talking about uh, the, the burial place of, of Peter and those who wanted to be around him in the Scavi, you also have graffiti, uh, which is, of course, one of the hallmarks of ancient Rome and of modern Rome, uh, of those who are saying, Peter, pray for me. Peter, pray for us. And they came uh, to pray there for their loved ones. And they did so because they believed that prayers were necessary for their deceased loved ones. We would never pray if we thought that they were already in heaven. We would never pray to try to get them a furlough from hell. We prayed because we believe in what the church has taught, that m most people die with the need to be cleansed in order to come into the full brightness of the Lord's glory in heaven. Pope Benedict himself wrote about that in his encyclical letter on Christian hope in November of 2007. And so we continue our prayer for P Pope Benedict that he might be purified and enter into that light he proclaimed. And we are seeing the signs, Danke Papst Benedikt, uh, in German. Thank you, Pope Benedict. We know that bells have been ringing throughout all of the 27 dioceses and archdioceses of Germany. This is someone who we were talking earlier from Germany, but in particular from Bavaria. And it is nice to see that uh, he is remembered and loved in his homeland. And that uh, image there where the curtain, that big, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, heavy curtain across the... Uh, main door of St. Peter's, the portico closed, and of course the gospel uh, speaks about the curtain in the temple, uh, saying that, you know, at the moment of Jesus' entry into heaven, that the temple is, the temple curtain is torn in two. Uh, here we see it's closed, and uh, with hope we await the day that the, t the temple curtain is opened to Pope Benedict and to others. And now there's a very moving moment inside, because it's private. I mean, it's a very large church. And uh, I remember Cardinal George late of Chicago saying that when they carried John Paul past, uh, all the cardinals gave a kind of a gesture of affection, removing their zucchetti. And uh, uh, that's a private thing. And then they'll go down to the um, to the grottos and do the final burial. Yeah, which is also something that cardinals do in life. Uh, when yes, that was the idea. The Holy they, Father they removed their zucchetti. And uh, so that procession will take place. And uh, the next images we'll see that will be released will be that probably the photograph of the of the tomb. And when people come to visit St. Peter's, they often go down there, mm -hmm. pray at St. Peter's tomb, and then they stop at the tombs of the various uh, popes. And uh, probably starting tomorrow, there'll be people visiting uh, the tomb of Pope Benedict XVI. Vatican estimates there were about 200,000 pilgrims who came for three days to visit Pope mm -hmm. Benedict when he was in St. Peter's. Estimated tens of thousands here this morning, um, a cold, foggy morning here in, in Rome. Uh, what are some immediate reflections following the funeral mass for Pope Benedict the Sixteenth? Extraordinarily beautiful liturgy in which the treasury of the church's liturgical prayer, of which Pope Benedict was such a fervent custodian, was, was placed at the service of the church's prayer. The, many of the prayers that were here will be used at our funerals. And every funeral that we go to is an opportunity for us likewise to be able to follow in these very footsteps, accompanied by the prayer of the church throughout all the centuries. And so that was the first thing that really touched me today. More than just the funeral mass of a pope, we had a funeral mass of a disciple of Jesus who believed to the very end that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, and he would see him on his last day. I will say we have a, a few minutes left of this special coverage. I feel like we could speak about Pope Benedict at length. 
there's so much to be said and so much that we have yet to say, but how do, how do you think Pope Benedict will be remembered in the history of the church and just how do you think his legacy will stand? Well, he started his pontificate on the central balcony of St. Peter's, and it's very moving when a pope dies because he goes out underneath the balcony where he starts, you know, the visually. Uh, he's on the top when he comes out, and then he lies down below, and maybe they even think about that when they look out from that loggia that that's the spot we'll end up. Uh, when he first appeared, he said his first words were after the great John Paul, the great Pope John Paul, and he came after... And I think one of the gifts we haven't really spoken about is that after the history-shaping, monumental papacy of John Paul II, had we gone to Pope Francis immediately or to anybody else in the College of Cardinals other than Cardinal Ratzinger, I think the shock would have been too great uh, because the, the differential in capacity, the move, the move from a colossus of history to an ordinary man of no equivalent impact would have been a bit of whiplash mm -hmm. and I think the mission given to this 78 year old man who may well have thought I've already done my bit was to continue that extraordinary impact on a more intellectual level perhaps than a sort of world conquering level but to extend that papacy in his case another eight years and in a way give it a kind of a coda of which today is the final part, uh, so that the church gets back to a normal life, which isn't actually John Paul and Benedict. That's the exception in the life of the church. And I think that was one of his great services at the end of a long life, uh, was to come after John Paul and, and to give that enormous pontificate a proper completion or fulfillment, I would say. Mm -hmm. I likewise, when we look at this, Pope Benedict gave the church a pretty smooth transition Mm -hmm. Normally, as I said a little early this week, when a Holy Father dies, every Catholic in the world feels a little bit orphaned. But today, as we saw at that very end of the service, when Pope Benedict and St. Peter's successor, Pope Francis, blessed and reverenced the casket of his predecessor, we still very much have a Holy Father to lead us today. And so we're grateful, not just for the gift of Pope Benedict to the church, but for the gift of the papacy, which lives still mm -hmm. and keeps the church young and full of joy. Well, Benedict XVI was the first pope to resign in 600 years, to abdicate. There was some concern initially, especially after he passed, that this would be what he's only remembered for. I think this week has given us the, the first opportunity to begin to assess him but then also to reflect on his immense contributions in the history of the church. I've said it many times now that he is one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, one of the greatest minds in the history of the church. Pope Francis quoted St. Gregory the Great in his homily today. We've talked about another great pope, Leo I. The church thinks in centuries, and I'm very confident that centuries from now, we will have popes and saints and theologians looking back and quoting Benedict XVI, Joseph Ratzinger, and still deriving from him the great lessons that we've had the benefit of having in mm -hmm. our lifetimes, mm -hmm. but also then developing as Benedict did with the fathers of the church and the doctors of the church, that friendship with them. I look forward to the day, and I won't be here, when future theologians and popes look back at Benedict as their friend and carry on the legacy and continue to be grateful for his contributions to the church. One of the things about Father Raj mentioned about the gratitude for the office of Peter, uh, that image we saw never been seen in the history of the church ever before. Pope Francis reverencing the coffin of his predecessor. Linus didn't do that for Peter and no one's ever done it ever uh, in that way. That's an image of apostolic succession that we never anticipated seeing. But the church grows and lives and uh, develops, and that's an image of apostolic succession that has never been seen. And we were, it's, it's, a, it's a grace to see it, not just on a level of human emotion, which it was you know, moving on a human level, but uh, that's an image of a theological truth that we've never seen before. And that will 
I think, remain in our memory for some time. Absolutely, an image that's never been seen and an image we were able to broadcast across the globe and it has been a privilege to have brought our viewers the funeral mass for Pope Benedict the 16th, a privilege to be with you three and to have learned more about Pope Benedict. Um, that concludes our coverage of the funeral mass for Pope Benedict the 16th. We will be back tomorrow morning here as to cover the Epiphany Mass. And again, I encourage all viewers to go to EWTN.com slash Benedict to find all the details about our special programming remembering Pope Benedict the 16th. God bless you. The EWTN family mourns the passing of our beloved Holy Father, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. An encyclical is perhaps the best known category of papal document. The name indicates a circular letter after the pattern of the Catholic epistles of the New Testament. An encyclical expresses the mind of the Pope on some matter of faith or morals, and although they may contain fresh insights, they typically do not express new doctrine. Instead, they apply the perennial teaching of the Church to the circumstances of a particular time in history or a particular people. Solemn magisterial teaching, including new dogmatic definitions, are generally given through an apostolic constitution. Thus, encyclicals are the highest ordinary form of papal teaching. Lower forms include apostolic letters, exhortations, homilies, audiences, discourses, and messages. I'm Colin Donovan, EWTN's Vice President for Theology. To purchase the EWTN Religious Catalog home video DVD set of Catholic Korea, log on to our web store, EWTNRC.com, and type in item HDCK, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. In hearing of the passing of Pope Benedict, I was thinking of his great gift that he gave to us in the Catholic Church, where he asked us to see the beauty of our liturgy. He was a, a great reminder that the liturgy is not about us, it's about God. I think there's, a, there's an easy temptation to fall into that it becomes all of a sudden too focused on us, just like a gathering. We just get together, but we forget that a focus is on God. It's an act of worship. It's God's work that we're able to participate in. Yes, we do it together, we come together, but ultimately the focus is on God himself. And Pope Benedict XVI did a lot of work to remind us of this. He believed that the liturgy should be presented with all due reverence, solemnity, and devotion. I think history will look back to realize that he is, if not the greatest theologian of our time.